Season 11, episode 21, McDreamy says goodnight. Let's watch it together. Be woo! Okay, first mistake he's making here, you need to call for help. My phone's not working. Because there's very limited things you can do on the road without any tools. You need to call for help and get emergency transport to get them to a hospital where they could actually be taken care of. Hey, I can't open the door. Wait, Everything. wait. Ma'am, hey. Winnie. Hey, what's your name? Sarah. Sarah, who's Winnie? Not my daughter. Hey, you Winnie? I think I'm dead. Well, you're not dead. I can feel a pulse in your wrist. And you can't be dead if your heart's still beating. See, I'm a doctor and I'm telling you. If you ever want to know you're dead, feel your pulse. <laughs> Maybe that's a little dark thing to say to a child. Listen, getting you out is going to hurt a lot. I don't know if it's shock or if it's that my leg hurts so badly that I almost can't recognize it almost feels normal, so maybe um, it won't be so bad getting me out. Sounds like you just look at your hip. How does he know that? He's just like feeling around over there, and he's like, yeah, dislocated the hip. Eh, eh, no special test. Eh. I gotta get you out of this car, okay. down on the ground, and then pop it back into the socket. How does he know it's dislocated versus like a full-on fracture that's displaced? He just has miraculous hands that have x-ray feel. The dislocation has cut off the blood supply to your leg. If I don't do something, you could lose it. So that's the only time you would do a reduction in the field like this. If you see that the vascular supply, meaning the blood flow that is going to the lower limb is obstructed because of the uh, dislocation. That can happen. In this case, yeah, he should try and put it back so that he restores blood flow. Otherwise, literally the rest of her leg starts dying in the crossing. <laughs> Whenever you do a reduction of dislocation, initially, worst pain ever. Afterwards, feels kind of good. No! No! Does it hurt anymore? No. I'm not supposed to be here. I have to go. Listen to me. You're probably in shock, okay? You have a lot of adrenaline going through you right now. There might be something wrong with you that you don't feel right now, so I need you. That is very accurate. In fact, paramedics are trained to tell folks who've been in car accidents to calm down because it's very easy to say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I don't need to go and get emergency care because you are on adrenaline, you don't feel your internal injuries and you could potentially be bleeding out. And it's also so important to know the mechanism of the injury. Like the fact that this was such a high speed car accident already puts her at a high risk of severe fractures, vertebral fractures, internal bleeding. <laughs> I just need to undo a button so I can look at your stomach. He's gonna see, like, bruising. Or he's gonna see a giant laceration <laughs> with intestines. Gotta hand it to you, Doc. Go home and have yourself a drink. You earned it. Thanks. Oh! And that's why you don't stop in the middle of the road. Run force trauma to the head, chest, and abdomen. Persistent hypotension after two liters of saline. Coast is ready at 130. Okay, so that's important information. So after giving him two liters of fluid to try and bump up his blood pressure, it's still persistently low, which means that he's in a dangerous spot. Ideally, they wanna give him more fluids, more blood products. If that fails, you have to start him on pressors in order to keep his blood pressure up to give sufficient blood flow to the vital organs. Also, they said his blood, uh, his pulse is 130, which means that it's fast tachycardic. Reason being is when the blood pressure is low, the heart tries to compensate by beating faster in order to like fake increase the pressure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Loss of verbal skills. Possible bleeding in the brain. His peoples are equal and reactive. Good sign. Still should get a CT. He's got a flail chest in the right. I need a 36 French tube now. Uh, so they said he has a flail chest. That means he has significant rib fractures, like complete fractures on one side, maybe even a pneumothorax. Because what happens is when you have a complete disconnect of your chest like that, your breathing happens paradoxically um, on the side where you have your injury. This is gonna hurt, but we have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> 
They're basically putting in a chest tube to drain it, uh, his chest of blood because he's bleeding internally, which will allow his lungs and potentially his heart to expand uh, when they are beating and filling up with either air or blood respectively. You also, sometimes if you have a pneumothorax, a collapsed lung, when you equalize the pressure, you allow the lung to expand as well. He fixed her leg, he helped Charlie, and he put a lot of his insides back in. He saved us. He saved you? All of us. He's a doctor. He's a doctor. So you should treat him differently than you would any other patient. What? We've got you. It is all gonna be okay. This isn't right. You should have taken me to get a head CT. Anytime you have blunt force trauma to the head with a serious accident, again, mechanism of injury, semi-truck hitting you at a fast rate of speed, get CTs. We over-order CTs in emergency rooms for things that don't really matter. Yet when people have a really high-speed car accident, people are like, should we get a head CT? Yes, you need to figure out if there's bleeding internally because your management completely changes. We have to work fast, people. I'm stable. Guys, I'm stable. Take me to get the head CT. The way you decide if someone's stable is you look at their vitals. If his blood pressure is not tanking, you know that the patient is stable enough to go get a head CT. And if there's bleeding in the brain, you want to save the brain, because without the brain, there is no body. Uh, he's got a great two splint o'clock. Meredith would leave it. Let's leave it. Check the four quadrants. And she double check the retrohepatic space. The retrohepatic space is a very commonly known one that you learn in uh, your surgery rotations where you can lose a lot of blood and not even know it. He's still hypotensive. Hylum's intact. He's not bleeding into his chest. This makes no sense. We're missing something. Set for a TEE. Not that. That's not what you're missing. A TEE is a transesophageal echocardiogram where essentially you put a, an ultrasound probe into the esophagus in order to better visualize the heart. He had a head lack. Check his pupils. His right pupil's blown. Anisocoria can happen when you are having bleeding into the brain. Paid to neurosurgery right freaking now. Come on. The hell have you people screwed up now? Us? You're on call for trauma. What took you so long? Who the hell are you? Your response time was supposed to be 20 minutes. It wouldn't have made a difference. If you guys had ordered a head CT, you would call me sooner. You were supposed to be here in 20 minutes, not an hour and a half. We had a chance. He had a freaking chance. Get out of my OR. What? That type of blame game can happen in a hospital setting where there's big egos. Uh, I mean, obviously both are in the wrong. Does it matter who's more wrong? No, the only thing that should matter is the patient and trying to do the best that they could now. It's too late. The call to not get a head CT was a bad call. We're not a trauma center or a teaching hospital. You did the best you could. I mean, a head CT, like, if they made a mistake with some kind of protocol, I get it, because they're not a trauma center, that makes sense. But not getting a head CT is just incredible to me. Like, that's the first thing you would do in a car accident of that nature. Remember, the mechanism of injury, There, in fact, there's like a, a, a Canadian head CT protocol, and one of the, the points is, the mechanism of injury. And it's like, if it's a high speed accident, boom, you get the head CT. Like, I still even remember that from med school. I also don't quite understand how they were certain that he had abdominal bleeding over, like, how do they know he wasn't bleeding into his brain versus his abdomen? Like, it seemed like they just guessed that. Because if you're doing anything, you're pan scanning the patient. You're scanning the head, you're scanning the lungs, I mean, the chest and the abdomen. You're doing it all at once. Mrs. Shepard, there's some things you need to know. Some things we need to discuss. Difficult things. I'm a doctor. You've waited the requisite number of hours, and now you can officially declare him dead. So, the ICU needs a bed. Those must be the papers. Essentially, the ICU wants to clear the patient out if there is no improvements being made. And while that is part of what goes into medical decision making, obviously when it comes to triage, but also it's in the patient's best interest to not be further tortured if there's no potential chance of recovery. A stop all curative intervention. Discontinue all routine monitoring, remove all the catheters, drains, and tubes, and any and all treatments that might provide comfort to the patient. Terminate all 
life-sustaining measures. Well, see, that's not exactly true. When we fill out a pulse form, we actually can put orders in that would put a patient on comfort care. So we would put orders in to make sure that the patient is comfortable, giving them high sedation, giving them pain control, mucus control, cough control, hiccup control. There's all sorts of things that we need to think about for a patient who's at the end of their lives. And we do that with our comfort care order set. When we choose to say that aggressively treating someone one causes them more harm than actual benefit. We're not saying discontinue everything. We're discontinuing certain things that we feel like harm the patient, and we continue certain things or begin things that we think would benefit the patient, meaning that the goal is no longer to make the patient live longer, but to make the patient as comfortable as possible. Oh no, McDreamy's gonna die. <laughs> One of the mistakes I've seen residents make is when they are putting a patient on comfort care and they're discontinuing the ventilator and all these things, they forget to turn off the alarms. Because remember, the alarms are supposed to notify you when a patient's crashing and it's very discomforting for a family to watch their loved one go peacefully, but then the alarm's going off like crazy that the patient's dying. So you gotta turn those off as well. And they didn't turn off the alarms. McDreamy! One of the hardest conversations in medicine is the end of life conversation. And this is supposed to happen, not just with someone who's terminally ill, someone who's just been in a car accident. It's supposed to happen with your primary care doctor. So you can have a plan because without a plan, so many things can go wrong. What's to happen? What are their wishes? Who's gonna be the power of attorney? What do they want from their care, medically speaking? And an important aspect of that is understanding that there's never a surefire correct answer. Because patients a lot of times will ask of me as a doctor, should I do this? Should I take them off life support? Do they have a chance to get better? A lot of times you have to give the most accurate answer, but it's not a 100% accurate answer. A lot of folks are not comfortable with that, but the unfortunate reality is that's life. Every decision cannot be 100%. And ultimately it's your choice that has to be decided upon based on the wishes of what the patient wanted. Here's the difference between real doctors and TV doctors. Click here to check that out. Great video, I share some epic patient stories. And as always, stay happy and healthy, unlike McDreamy.